We still got a couple of minutes yet, but uh, I wanted to pass around one of these target boards. This is uh, an example of a board. This is a built version of the board you can build. I supply the, the green circuit board and I supply all the parts. You build it and you can keep it. Or I'll take it back if you don't want it. The, uh, this year's version, instead of having a serial port here, has a USB port. And next year's version will have this end cut off with just a header for either a USB port, a serial port, or a radio. So, if you wanted to this year, you could cut the end off. But, uh, but these, uh, we'll have enough of these that everybody can build one or two if they want. You have to budget it, however, if you build it for the final project, the budget cost of this completed is about $15. You don't pay $15, that's how much you have to subtract from your effective budget of $75. By the way, the, if you go over budget on the final project, your score do, goes down as the square of the of amount of money that you are over. <laughs> so going over 10 cents doesn't matter. Going over $10, it turns out, matters quite a lot. <laughs> So I'll pass this around, pass it around the class. I like, I like nonlinear relationships. It encourages certain kinds of behavior. <laughs> so for instance, the, there, uh, for the final project, there's going to be a bonus. <gasps> I say, everybody goes, <gasps> uh, for finishing early. And especially the Friday group, the slope day group, the 30 people who are going to be there all afternoon on slope day. So if you finish early, you get a score boost which is proportional to the square root of the number of days early. So it's, 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 it's a fairly large boost for a few days and a fairly small boost for a lot of days. You finish 30 days early, I think it's worth 15 points. 30 days early is you finish before you start. <laughs> There's one group that's already said they're going to do that. <laughs> Any questions about lab one so far? Of the three lab sessions we've had, Two groups have completely finished and checked out. It's not bad. Pretty good. Seen some pretty good progress. Again, any questions about Lab 1 or Homework 1? So there's three small topics that are sort of lingering with respect to Lab 1 before we start Lab 2. One of them is, how do you generate a square wave? This, which is answered in the uh, code example, by the way, on the, on the lab. Another question is, how do we use EEPROM exactly, which is also answered uh, in a demo code on lab one. And the third one is, how do you write a debounce state machine, which as of this morning has a code linked online, uh, but uh, was actually linked online before, but I didn't associate it with, co uh, with uh, lab one. So, which of those three would you like to hear about first? Sounds Show of hands! That wake somebody up, sorry. EEPROM. Square waves. Debounce. Oh, well, okay, that's a clear winner, debouncing. The EEPROM is actually embarrassingly easy to use. Um, <clears throat> The generating a square wave using timer 2 is also quite easy. In fact, it's so easy that that's what's confusing. People look at the code and say, that can't possibly work. <laughs> All you need is five lines of code, which is never repeated. It's in the header, it's in the init session, section before the while one. There is no interrupt service routine associated with it. You initialize the timer to make a square wave, it makes a square wave forever. <laughs> 
Oops, how do you turn it off? And it looks like the homework. And I know, by the way, it looks like the homework. What's the easiest way of turning off the square wave? If it's, a, if it's an autonomous timer with no software that's generating a square wave, disable the prescaler. If you set the prescaler to zero, it stops counting. You turn it back on, it starts counting again. It's absolutely the simplest way. Can't you set the... Because there's one of the options that's to set the pin to, to clear, I think, on... That. Oh, you can, mess, you can mess with the with the pin. There's three options for the pin. Set on match, clear on match, toggle on match. If you set it to toggle on match, it produces a square wave. If you set it to either clear or set on match, it does not. So that would work also. Okay, debounce. Do I need to draw the debounce state machine again? The diagram? Nah. That was the last thing I did last time, I think. So let's now go back to a version of the code which is very similar to Sketch 1, except that we're going to detect two buttons being pushed. Button 0 is going to be not debounced. Button 1 will be debounced. And both of the buttons, when pushed, will increment a counter, which is then displayed on the LEDs. So I'm not going to write the interrupt service routine. It's the usual one millisecond interrupt service routine. I'm not going to write main, which is just a, a dispatcher that dispatches three tasks. All I'm going to write is the task that absorbs the button push and turns it into an increment, and then the two, the two tasks, one of which does a, uh, a debounced detect and the other does a non-debounced detect. I do not have a preference on it, but people have a tendency to push really hard on buttons when they're trying to do it fast. And the board, so you have this circuit board like this, which is supported by a foot at each end. Button 7 is here, button 0 is here, and button 3 is in the center. Which one do you think breaks the board the fastest when you push hard on it? So the flex on a board goes as what power of the distance from the support? Mechanical engineer? Third power? Use seven or zero. Okay. So task one. Task one is going to notice that a button has been pushed and increment the timer. In increment a counter. So we say if, well, task two and task three are both going to set a flag called push flag. So if push flag. We're going to set push flag together to zero to so the, so that we get one increment per button push. We're going to then increment the LED variable and then set port B to not LED because again the LEDs are active low and then we're going to end the if and then we're going to end the task so task 2 then is going to do a button detect without debounce. 
no debounce. And what we're going to do is we're going to say if not pin D is equal to 0x01, zero zero that is to say button 0, then flag equals 1. End. Straightforward. <clears throat> And the behavior of the system when you push the button is that it will be impossible to get exactly one count per button push. So vo task three will be the debounced version which will give you precisely one count of the LED every time you push and release the button. We're going to enter task three. Every 30 milliseconds. So it's going to, we're going to get into task three every 30 milliseconds. We're getting into task two every 30 milliseconds also. But with task two, unless you happen to exactly hit the button at the time the task executes, you miss it, either miss the event if you have a very, very fast finger, or you get two events or six events. And what we're going to do over here is we're just going to build a big old state machine which switches off some variable called push state. Push state's going to have four possible values corresponding to the names of the states in the state, dia state transition diagram I did last time, which I think was release, maybe pushed, pushed, may be released. So in the switch statement, <clears throat> in the switch statement then we're going to start with a case of no push or release. And that's a full colon. And in this state, so we fall into the, into the task every 30 milliseconds. We search for the state. If we're in state not pushed, then we, we do a if pin D, if not pin D is equal to equal equals 0x02, zero zero that being button 1, the value of button 1. Then, push state goes to maybe. Else, where do we go? In other words, I wouldn't actually have to put an else in here because the state doesn't change. But for symmetry, I'm going to say else push state equals no push which is probably is the state it's already in and then because of the way C handles case statements you have to put a break here otherwise it falls through to the next case by default unlike MATLAB which does exactly the opposite
and Verilog, which does, does, does not fall through. Oh well. So case, the next case in the case statement is going to be case maybe push. I guess I just called it maybe down there. Maybe. Full colon. And then, boringly enough, if not, pin D equals equals 0, x, 0, 2. Now here we have to need two statements. One is push state equals what? We had two successful pushes in a row, therefore we have a valid push, and so we're going to go to state push. And we have to set the push flag. Else. Else, if it's not pushed, where do we go? Where? Where? What's the what's the consensus? No push. Break. Case pushed. If pin D, not pin D, is equal to equal zero x zero two. Push state equals what? Pushed. Pushed. We stay in this state. Else. Push state equals maybe release. Maybe release. Break. And then case may release. If not, pin D equal equal zero x zero two. This this phrase here would be a perfect thing to put in a text macro. A define, but I didn't do that. If pin D is equal to zero x zero two, push state equals uh oh we got a, we got a we got a release up here but now we're back to push meaning that the button is still bouncing so where do we have to go say again nope go back to pushed Else, 
Else, at this point now, we've gotten two releases in a row, which means that the button is truly and really released, and so we go to no push. And then we end the case statement, and then we end the task. You don't need to put a break there because it's the last one. So it falls through. Although for symmetry, I often do put a break there. Wouldn't your if statements fail if someone was pushing two buttons? Well, this is only detecting one button. Oh yes, yes, it would fail. Okay, yeah, no, no, you know, you're quite right. It would fail, and that's probably correct behavior to have it fail. In this case. Right, so what that does is to increment the LED variable and then output it. So it's counting. So it's a counter. And with the debounced version, every, te every time you press button one, you increment the count precisely once. With the undebounced, non-debounced, non-debounced button, button zero, every time you push the button, you get a count someplace between zero and the amount of latency that your <coughs> finger has on the button divided by 30 milliseconds. <coughs> so the debounce code gives you a way of detecting discrete events as push button pushes or push button pushes as discrete events. For lab two, you absolutely have to debounce the entire keypad. We're going to be using a 16 button keypad instead of the, uh, the STK500 buttons and you have to debounce them because you're going to be switching back and forth between functions using the keypad for the digital voltmeter. For this lab, you absolutely have to debounce the release of the button. Not necessarily the push, but the release. Before you push again. And also, does that mean without debounce, if you just push the button and just keep pushing? It'll keep counting. It, 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 it'll keep counting. Yeah, every 30 milliseconds. That, that would be a power in case like a cell phone or a dialer of any sort. You, you don't want to. If you, if, you're, if you hold it down a little bit while you're thinking about the number, you don't want to get six digits all the same. Yeah. Right. For this lab, though, do you do the 30 milliseconds? Don't we really just care that we don't have any, um, we don't register several pushes for just a single So in this lab, you push once to start the system. If you're still pushed two seconds later, you're either cheating or you've gone to sleep. All right. So you do not have to detect the button up. Unless you want, so t cheating could have two possibilities in this lab, either which of which is okay, either, either alternative of which is okay. One is you push and, and release. And if you push again before the random timeout, then you've cheated. The other interpretation is you can push and release as many times as you want before the random timeout as long as you are released at the moment that the timeout occurs. See the difference? Either one of those is, a, is okay. One of them requires you to debounce, the other one does not. Once you've pushed and released to start the process going, a second and a half, between one second and two seconds later, 
you're going to the bell's going to go off, you have to push the button as fast as you can. That push button, that push cannot be debounced because you can't tolerate the 30 millisecond ambiguity. Because you're timing down to the millisecond. The release of that button has to be debounced. You have to have released it for at least two 30 millisecond intervals in a row before you can press again to send the system back to the ready state. So the only button transition that absolutely has to be debounced is the release after the timing, after, after you've timed your uh, reflexes. Anything else? Well, let's talk a little bit about, just a little bit about square wave generation then. This is, like I said, embarrassingly easy. The demo code that I produced, the, I think it's called Timers, GCC. Um, <clears throat> uses timers in three different ways because I wanted to put as much as I could in, in one code. So the timer zero does it with the usual one millisecond time base. Timer one is sitting there waiting for a positive transition. And on every positive transition on its input pin, it records its own value into a register called the capture register. And it throws an interrupt. The interrupt service routine then goes and reads the capture register and gets a cycle accurate time of occurrence of the transition. So the timer one is running continuously, very fast, 16 times a microsecond. Takes five or six microseconds to get into the interrupt service routine. The interrupt service routine then looks back and says, oh, I know the exact time that occurred because it's frozen in a separate register. So even though there's a software latency to read the, the capture register, the capture register has the exact time of the pin transition frozen in it. Very handy. So if I were to measure two transitions in a row, I could get a time between them or a frequency, therefore which you'll need for lab two because one of the things I want you to do is build a frequency meter. So you'll have to use timer one in capture mode to build the frequency meter. But for this lab, the frequency that's being generated, the square wave which is being generated that is being fed into timer one is being generated by timer two. Timer two is sitting in an autonomous square wave mode, generating a 200 cycle long square wave, which is then being measured by timer one. And guess what? It measures 200 cycles. That actually gave me some faith that it was cycle accurate. It also meant that for, for purposes of demo, I didn't have to hook up a square wave generator and try and figure out which was more accurate, the square wave generator or the microcontroller. So the square wave generator then, first of all, we choose the, we choose the, the half duration OCR 2A, output compare register timer 2 channel A, I'm going to set to 99, so a half cycle is 100 cycles. <clears throat> that's 100, that's 100, that's 100, because I'm going to be toggling the I.O. pin. I set TCCR 
to b to 1, which is full speed, that's the prescalar divided by 1, I set TCCR2A to turn on the COM 2A0 bit and OR that with the WGM21 bit. This, this commands the timer. This bit commands the timer to connect its compare register to the output pin. This connects the timer output, the, the compare register output to the to an I.O. pin, so it physically makes I.O. This one causes the timer to clear on compare match. So it's going to count up to a compare match. It's going to flip the I.O. bit from one state to another. It's going to count up to an I.O. match. It's going to clear itself. It's going to flip the bit. It's going to count up to timer match, clear itself, flip the bit, and so on. The only other thing we need to do is to set DDRD, the data direction register for port D, to turn on pin D7 as an output. <clears throat> Why D7? It's the it's the pin, it's the pin the designers decided to connect from timer 2 to the output. There's no reason. AVR, the architecture we're using, stands for Arnie and Vern's risk machine. It's whatever Arnie and Vern decided to do. And they decided to hook timer 2 to pin D.7. And so that's what you get to do. There's no reason, it's just policy. Once you execute these four commands, timer two starts to produce a square wave forever. The easiest way to toggle it on and off is to toggle this between one zero. One and zero. Turns it on and off. One is no divide, so it's full speed. So what's 200 cycles? Let's see, uh, 200 cycles is, uh, divide that by 16, that's about, uh, mm, um, it was about 16, mil 16 microseconds, right? 16 microseconds. So that's what you said, that's about 600 kilohertz. 800 kilohertz? I don't think you'd hear that. So you're going to have to divide, you're going to have to set this to a different number to actually hear it, of course. What do you have to set it to? Thousands! Billions! 20, you can hear 20 kilohertz? I think that's like the upper range. Yeah, that's enough to cause the TAs to come running over and say, what's wrong with you? <laughs> um, I can't hear 20 kilohertz anymore. I can't hear, you know, old, to some televisions produce 15,725 hertz because that's the high frequency transformer that generates the high voltage. I can't hear that anymore. Um, in fact, I can't hear above about 9 kilohertz unless it's really loud. That's what happens when you listen to too much loud music on your earbuds.
or you run a chainsaw for too long, <laughs> uh, or you fire a shotgun too many times without earplugs, all of which I've done. I'm <laughs> not at the same time. <laughs> Yeah, when I was a kid, nobody thought about ear protection. You, you went out and you blasted away with a chainsaw. You, know, yeah. you can't hear so good when you come back. Or go to, the, go to the drag races and sit in the pits, you know, and you have these flames shooting six feet out of these V8 engines into your face, you know, and your whole body's shaking like this because it's about 180 dBs. And the only ear protection is you put your, you put your fingers in your ears so it doesn't blow your eardrums out when they hit the throttle. Is this, and then you wonder why you can't hear the traffic as you're driving home. <laughs> oh well. But it's worse with earbuds. Because it's constant. And the damage is cumulative. And it's never repaired. <clears throat> Enough preaching. Um, <clears throat> Any questions on this? Easiest thing to do to generate a square wave is, of course, write four lines of code and listen to what comes out. And tune it that way. Although you can calculate within 0.005% what frequency the uh, square wave will be because that's about the accuracy of the Crystal is about 50 parts per million. Any questions? How accurate can you get on those crystals? If they sell higher accuracy ones? So, yes, they do sell higher accuracy ones, but to get much higher than 50 parts per million, you have to temperature regulate. So, your, one reason that you're wristwatch is rather accurate is that your wrist is always about the same temperature and so and if the crystal is in thermal contact with your wrist it always stays about 75 or 80 degrees or so and um, you can cut the crystal in a certain way so that it has a negative temperature coefficient below a certain uh, temperature and a positive temperature coefficient above the temperature or vice versa and at the temperature you want to operate it, it has zero temperature coefficient, and that's how they cut crystals for watches. So they have a zero temperature coefficient at about 80 degrees. The other way to do it is if you want extremely high accuracy is you run them really hot. You run them at a temperature which is higher than any reasonable temperature you're going to get in the environment, say uh, 50 C, and you put them in an oven, and you keep them hot at that temperature and you let them stabilize for a month and uh, and then the clock uh, you can get down to a part per million or so still not no atomic clock but it's pretty accurate is there any way of doing temperature do you actually measure the temperature and regulate the clock actively <clears throat> you can do that with a with a with a crystal clock it's it's probably not worth the trouble because you have to mechanically change the crystal and radio amateurs found out decades ago that you could modify slightly the frequency of a crystal oscillator by putting a set screw against it and torquing it pushing cr physically on the crystal you can bend the uh, resonant frequency but you don't want to get into that the control system for that's a mess Okay, we have a little more time. You want to? Do you want to talk about EE prompt, or do you want to start on lab two? Lab two. Lab two. EE prompt. How many for lab two? How many for EE prompt? Oh man, it's about so almost split. Well, I'll, I'll spend thirty seconds and tell you everything I know about EE prompt. First is, you can define, you don't have to do this, you can just use integers, 
but I like to define uh, constants. Let's say I want to store data in EEPROM position address 1. I can define a constant, EEPROM data, and then I can do an EEPROM later in the program assuming, ah, assuming that I have included if I do an include of AVR EEPROM dot H then I can say EEPROM write byte and I'm doing a byte so I'm going to cast this to a I'm going to cast this to a byte pointer a uint 8 star EEPROM data so I'm going to cast that to the appropriate pointer to EEPROM and then write a data in it. Let's say 20. That's the data value. And that will put a byte into EEPROM and it will be there even after you cycle the power on and off. Even if you pull the chip out of the board, put it into another board, it'll still be there. As you might guess, there's an EEPROM write word. There's also EEPROM read byte, which takes a uint 8 pointer to ROM. Prom. It's a very easy user interface. It's very easy to do. Anything you want. So um, the right word has a uh, UN 16 pointer instead of UN 8. That's correct. I was wondering, so is um, address 1 on the uh, UN 16 pointer equal to address 1 on the byte pointer or 2? In other words, are we... It should be 2. Okay, so we're addressing the 16-bit, uh, in terms of 16-bit words, instead of bytes. That would be the consistent way that the that the, the that the that the UN 16 should work. Okay. I have to say I haven't tried that to see where the bits actually end up in this case. So I just used two just to be safe. And uh, well, did it work? Yeah, it worked because I didn't try one. One is the one that could. So it might be in four. Yeah. yeah who cares? Right? Yeah. Until you do, until you want to write dense stuff, it doesn't matter. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah, I think you're doing it the right way. Okay. So if you write in the other position in the EEPROM, do we just do like the increments to the EEPROM minus one data? Or you just define another constant. So Are you going to write an array? If you're going to write an array, yes, you're going to increment the, in, the pointer. So it's like one, two, three, four, and then cast this number into your unsigned int eight. Yeah. Yeah. Typically, you're only going to be putting a few values in EEPROM. There's also some tutorials that are linked up on EEPROM, which you might want to look at. So for lab two, for lab two, we're going to build a Digital, digital multimeter with just three functions. We've got to draw the line somewhere. We could have done a lot more, but three is enough. There's going to be a voltmeter. We're going to have a resistance meter, and we're going to have frequency. <clears throat> and to keep things simple here, we're going to make that the voltage that we're going to define that the voltage you need to measure is 0 to 5 volts 
that the resistance is going to be, oh, perhaps in the 100 ohm to 100 K ohm range. So we're not going to get either ridiculously low or ridiculously high, although we could. This is a little easier. And the frequency is going to be in the <coughs> perhaps 10 hertz to 100 K hertz region. And we're going to use a bunch of facilities, <coughs> excuse me, a bunch of the facilities of the microcontroller. We're going to use, we're going to, to measure voltage, we're going to use an ADC, an analog to digital converter <coughs> that directly converts a voltage on port A, port A into a number. I'm going to ask you to auto range this. It's going to have to be auto ranging, which means that you're going to need, for a lower voltage, you're going to need to automatically get better sensitivity, either by changing a reference voltage internally or by using the internal amplifier. So it's going to be, the, so the voltage has to be auto ranging. <clears throat> to measure a resistance, well, how do you measure resistance? Given that we have a voltmeter, how do we measure a resistance? Jeremy? Yeah, so we're going to have a current source of some kind. We're going to have a current source, <clears throat> which in this case is going to be just resistors hooked to output ports. And you're going to auto range the resistance by choosing which of the resistors happens to be an active output and which one is turned off, which outputs are turned off. How do you turn off an input output? Make it an input. Then it goes to high impedance. The frequency meter, well, it would be nice to have that independent of amplitude. It would be nice to be able to not use the ADC because if you have some ugly input waveform, then you have to do all this threshold detection and stuff. But built into the microcontroller chip, as you may already know, or maybe not, is an analog comparator. There's an analog comparator that's quite fast, nanosecond fast, and it is pretty accurate, a few millivolts. So we're going to hook up a circuit that compares the input to some handy reference value like VCC over 2 and generates for this ugly input, it's the output of the comparator is going to be a nice, clean square wave. Of course, transitioning on the zero transitions, or the VCC over two transitions. So we're going to be using the ADC for voltage. We're going to be using the analog comparator to produce a square wave from ugly input to make a nice, easily counted waveform and then we're going to use the timer one capture which very nicely can be triggered off of the output of the comparator. The output of the comparator can trigger the timer one capture and so we can capture every edge and once we have the positive edges or the negative edges of the waveform we've got the time of the waveform and therefore the frequency. The period of the waveform and therefore the frequency. Is it, can you set it up as a Schmidt trigger, or is it, is it going to be every zero cross one? Oh, can you? You cannot set it up as a Schmidt trigger. There's no way to get. The output signal from the comparator is not brought to the outside, so you cannot set it up as a Schmidt trigger. 
uh, it, it doesn't have very much hysteresis, and so you could have noise problems. And that will be a limitation here. Do we have to account for the duty cycle as a 50% of the frequency? This will automatically calculate the period. As long as, it's a, as long as it is a cyclic waveform, as long as it's a cyclic waveform that crosses through VCC over 2, then, as long as it's periodic, then the positive transitions should give you the period. If the waveform is noisy, that's going to produce some jitter in the period and therefore some jitter in the frequency. But probably you'll be feeding in waveforms mostly from the signal generator, which will be beautiful and clean. Did you say something about that this chip has a uh, FFT capabilities on it? Oh, the chip is, a, uh, is not a wonderful arithmetic or a DSP chip, but you can, you can do an FFT at audio rate on this, as long as you write it in integer arithmetic and uh, don't get too careful about scaling the output for optimum accuracy. You can get about 128 points per, per, uh, per window at 8 kilohertz sample rate. But you'll be able to measure frequency much more accurately by timing the period than by doing an FFT. Now I'm going to talk about this a lot more. I'm just giving you the, the nosebleed level overview of this right now. So, there's going to be three functions. You're going to be using, you need to read up on, as soon as possible, you need to read up on the analog digital converter section, the uh, more about I.O. pins, and a little bit about the analog comparator. And I want to tell you, the piece of the data sheet that describes the ADD converter is the most complicated piece of writing I have read this side of Umberto Echo. It is a mess. It is really hard, at least for me to understand, it was so hard to understand that I couldn't tell if I got it right until I wrote the code. When the code ran, I knew I understood it. In fact, in general, that's the way my brain works. I don't understand stuff until I write the code myself. Um, and your pr brain is probably the same way. So, plow through some of the ADC documentation but more importantly, plow through the examples. I've seen a couple of people who have gone through the example codes very carefully. And by very carefully, I mean they've written more on it than I did. So there's more of their words written in red than I wrote in, uh, than characters I wrote in uh, 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 of source code. That's about the level at which you have to read these codes. You can't just say, oh yeah, oh, four lines. Uh. You really have to take it apart. Why did he set this stupid bit? Anything else? Any other questions? Okay, see a bunch of you in the lab in a few minutes. <laughs>